What do you get when you mix a Pokemon game featuring a completely new region and 100 plus brand new Pokemon designs with an insane plot featuring time travel, a healthy dose of amnesia, and a couple unbelievable twists? Well, you get one of the best fan-made Pokemon games out there. This is a game with so much content and so much to love. So without further ado, allow me to take you through the events and gameplay of one of the most impressive Pokemon fan games, Pokemon Infinity. The game begins as we wake up in a strange forest, surrounded by people we don't know with no memory of how we got here. They start asking us all sorts of questions about ourselves, and it seems like we really have no choice but to trust them, so we tell them our name is Daddy Q, and they introduce themselves as Professor Wormwood and his assistant Lucy. They seem trustworthy enough, so we accompany them back to the nearby town, where we rest for several hours. When we wake up, we have so many questions about where we are and how we got here, so we head over to the professor's lab to begin to unravel some of these mysteries. Come with me, Daddy Q. I've lived here for a long time. I've met hundreds of people. The thing is, Ego's a small island region. When someone new touches foot here, there isn't a soul on the island that isn't made aware in under a day. So why does no one know who you are? He goes on to explain that when they found us in the forest, we had no identification or travel records, and nobody has come or gone from the island for weeks. A strange mystery indeed. Let me ask you, do you know what a Pokemon is? What? What? The professor explains all about the Pokemon that inhabit this world, then tells us if we're going to traverse this island, we need a Pokemon of our own. And being a kind man, he even offers to give us one. For this, we have a choice between three regional variants of the original starters from Gen 1. There's the rock grass type form of Bulbasaur, the water flying type form of Squirtle, and finally the fire dragon type form of Charmander. Not gonna lie, this was a super tough choice because all three of these Pokemon designs are awesome. But eventually, we do settle on Charmander and nickname our new partner Charlie. After choosing our new friend, the professor sends us out to meet up with an old colleague of his, Professor Thorne, who runs the island's lighthouse. He says they should probably be able to help us start uncovering our past. Not wasting any time, we head out to begin our journey to Thorne's lab. On our way, we explore the town a bit and meet our new rival Teal, then start traversing the Moonstone Path where we end up coming across a dark flying type Egoian variant of Hoot Hoot. This form gives this bird a much needed facelift, so we decide to catch it and nickname it Hootie. Then as we're wading through the tall grass, we get challenged by this trainer and their pre-evolution form of Miltank, Calf Pint. I didn't know I needed this Pokemon to exist, but now it's my everything. <laughs> Anyway, we travel the rest of the route until we finally arrive at Merchant's Ridge just outside of the next town. Here, the professor's assistant Lucy catches up with us and gives us some old broken gadget that Wormwood wants Thorn to work on. With this new busted gadget, we head into Sea Ridge Town, which is home to the name raider of this region. So we head in to say what's up, then as we're rummaging through his trash cans, we find a curious crumpled note. And not wanting to leave any stone unturned, we unravel it and read, Tips for a good name number three. It should never be in all capital letters. That is insane. Uh, wow, okay, I feel personally attacked. We shake it off, then explore the town a bit more, killing all the berry trees in this lady's garden and fishing a stick out of yet another trash can. Now, with the trash sufficiently rummaged, we head out of town onto the Stone Dust Trail, where we battle some more trainers, catch some bunnies and bugs, and have our first battle against our rival Teal. His team is pretty weak at this point, only having a Starly and an Egoian Squirtle, so Hootie's able to take control and hand down a swift beating. On the other side of the Stone Dust Trail lies the Stone Dust peak, on top of which sits our destination, Professor Thorne's lab. But before we get there, we have to fight our way through this route, which includes a hiker with an edgy Egoian Spearow and baby Skarmory Arbord. After finding our way through all that, we finally arrive at the Professor's lab. Hey, you're finally here. The name is Professor Thorne. I talked to Wormwood a little bit ago. He said you may be in need of some assistance. Well, lucky for you, I'm the smartest there is. Oh, great. You're this kind of professor, huh? This lady then goes on and on listing out the specific subjects that she's mastered, blah, blah, blah. Eventually, she gets to the point and tells us that she has a few theories about how we might have ended up on this rock. But she needs to run a diagnostic scan of our brain to get some more information. So we follow her into her lab, but before we get scanned, of course, we rummage through the trash a little bit. It's probably illegal to dig through people's trash. Shut up, talking trash can. After raiding the bins, Thorne tries to boot up her scanning machine, but turns out there's an issue with one of her solar panels. 
channels, so she sends us outside to investigate it. On our way there, we end up catching a Nidoran, which we nickname Nick, then we locate the troublesome solar panel. Here we find this cyborg wannabe in the process of sabotaging the panel. This is our first encounter with the futuristic Lamos, Team Fate. We defeat the grunt and fix the solar panel, which restores the power. Then we head back into the lab and hop right into this gigantic machine, no questions asked. Right as we do that, things get a little weird. We're teleported to some strange, foggy place where we're surrounded by broken pillars, a spooky hospital bed, and a ghost that just keeps repeating the same thing. As great as this place is, <laughs> we really want to leave as soon as possible. Hopefully it's one of those dream situations where you go to sleep in your dream and wake up in the real world. You know what I'm talking about. We hop into bed and throw the covers over our head. We wake up back safe and sound in Thorne's lab and she says that we fell asleep during the diagnostic and that was all just a weird dream. Thorne then tells us that she needs some time to study the data she just gathered from our diagnostic. And in the meantime, she needs us to head down to Echo Rock Town to get some arcane more, which she needs in order to fix that old broken gadget from Wormwood. So we head down through the Stone Dust Grove, then make our way through the twisting maze that is the Echo Ridge Cave. As we're working our way through the cave, we level up Charmander enough for it to evolve into a Charmeleon. This evolution is the point where you can really see the Egoian Charizard line take shape into its dragon form. Such a sick design. Anyway, eventually we find our way out the other side of the cave and arrive at Echo Rock Town which is currently celebrating the Koros Festival. The Koros Festival is a celebration of the legendary Pokemon Palkia, who saved Ego from some sort of calamity a hundred years ago. We try not to get too caught up in the festivities since we're on a mission, and so we start talking to the locals to figure out where we can score some Arcanium ore. Amazingly, the first guy we talk to just so happens to have a piece of ore, but unfortunately, he says he'll only give it to us if we manage to defeat the council member Geralt in a Pokemon battle. Council members are basically this game's version of gym leaders, and this guy is from a town that is far away from here. So if I know anything about Pokemon games, he's gonna have a ridiculous team. The hiker also tells us that the Arcanium Refinery is closed for the festival, so this is gonna be our only option to get the ore anytime soon. And so we reluctantly accept his deal. Then we spend some time checking out the town a bit more before walking up to the old man Geralt and refusing to leave him alone until he agrees to battle us. He makes some lame excuse about not having a full strength team with him since he wasn't planning on battling blah 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 excuses excuses but even with his weaker squad we end up falling to the might of his Fero. In defeat we head over to the old wishing well in town to simply ask why? The well did not respond. Well, well, looks like we're gonna have to figure something else out. We train up the team a bit until Hootie evolves into a knocked owl, then we go back and take another shot at Geralt. This time, we're able to clutch it out, and as a reward for defeating him, Geralt is actually required by law to give us his badge. Didn't expect that, but I'll certainly take it. And now that we've defeated Geralt, this hiker rewards us with the Arcanium Ore as promised, and we head back to Thorn's lab to deliver it. She congratulates us on our victory, then tells us she has some good news and some bad news. Not being a coward, we ask for the bad news first. The bad news is that Thorn is gonna need more time to figure out what's going on with this whole how we got stranded here situation. Not so bad, okay. What's the good news then? Oh, she has another errand for us to go on. That kind of seems like the bad news. Anyway, Thorne needs us to deliver a rejection letter to the owner of the Safari Zone, who has asked for her to make an appearance at its grand opening. Oh, the Aaron wasn't the good news. The good news is that she repaired the broken gadget. Nice. And this random gadget turns out to be a party-wide experience share, which is much appreciated after the multiple hours I just spent grinding for Geralt, let me tell ya. Now with our brand new refurbished experience share, we head out to make our way to Amberfield Town, in maybe the most roundabout way possible. It's a good thing that the route design in this game is so awesome and engaging, otherwise I would be quite upset about the way we have to go. First, we backtrack all the way back to the very first town, Haydust Town. Then we head south from there onto the Hayfield Path, where we find and catch this grumpy boy, a rock fighting type Egoian Merrill, which we nickname Smasher. Then we find a Mickleberry. So we double back to the Merchant Ridge, where there is a very hungry Eevee, who just so happens to love Mickleberries. We feed it the berry, then we're rewarded with an Eevee Egg, which would be an exciting prospect on its own, but it's even more exciting since this game introduces 11 brand new Eeveelutions. One for each type that doesn't already have one, and a special bonus evolution is the cherry on top. 
At this point, we get to work hatching that egg by continuing our journey through the Hayfield Plateau until we arrive at the entrance to the crossroads of this entire island, the Dark Dank Genesis Forest. Just before we enter the forest, Meryl levels up enough to evolve into an even grumpier boy, Azaril. Then we proceed into the woods, where we come across a couple Team Fate grunts and someone who looks to be their leader. We overhear the leader ordering them to search the forest for the mythical Pokemon Celebi, which she says has time distorting abilities that'll give them an upper hand. Huh. An upper hand in what exactly? Miraculously, without giving away any more information, Team Fate goes off to search for Celebi, and we work our way through the rest of the forest until we find this Egoian Magnemite. It's a bit flighty, so we end up chasing it around the entire forest, then out north until we corner it on the Palkin Trail. With nowhere to run, we're able to catch this fuzzy boy and nickname it Manny. At this point, it's just a short trip through the Ridgestone Cemetery and the Rolling Ridge until we arrive, wait, Back in Echo Rock, this isn't right? Well, at least the Koros Festival is finally over, so we're able to head into the gym where the council member has returned to accept challengers again. We bound over the dangerous gaps in the floor into the heart of this dojo, where we challenge the Elder Howlet. It does take us a couple attempts, but eventually we're able to use Smasher to take out his Ace Weavile and his Pawniard, then we clean up his Scyther with Charlie. As a reward for winning this battle, we get the badge and the TM for cut. With our new cutting capabilities, we backtrack a bit to Sea Ridge Town, where we now have access to an Astral Stone, which we use on Nick the Nidorino to evolve it into this game's special Nitto evolution, Nitto Rook. We also catch the Steel Water type Egoian Shelder, which we nickname Shelly, then add to the team. From here, we travel south out of Echo Rock Town, where where we use Cut to access the rest of the Rolling Ridge and further to the south, the Rolling Trail. Here we level Magnemite up enough that it evolves into a Magneton, then we finally arrive at our destination, Amberfield Town, home of the brand new Safari Zone. Before we head in to break the owner's heart with Thorn's rejection letter, we decide to talk to some locals to maybe lift our spirits a bit. It must be terrifying knowing that when you get older, you may forget everything you've ever done. Essentially erasing your own life. Look, lady, I just came in here to look through your trash can. With that piece of dialogue permanently etched into my frontal lobe, we head over to the grand opening of the Safari Zone, where we deliver the rejection letter to this poor guy, who honestly takes it pretty well. Before heading back to Thorn's lab, we decide to check out the Safari Zone a little bit. We give Manny the miracle seed to hold as we go in, then after a few battles, it sprouts a huge tree on its head and evolves into a Magnezone. Now with our errand run, we fly back to Thorn's lab, where she tells us that we need to go back into the scanner one more time to get a definite answer of where to go from here. You mean you want me to go back to the nightmare world? Okay. So after saving our progress, we get into the machine. And wouldn't you know, we get sent right back to the mist dimension. Only this time, this place is somehow creepier than before. We find ourselves in some kind of dungeon, and we try to go home by getting back in the bed, but that doesn't work this time. So naturally, we decide to follow the super long, dark hallway over here. And at the end of the hallway, we find a phone that's just ringing off the hook. So of course we answer it. Come back home. Jesus, I didn't sign up for this Pokemon horror game. We hang up the phone, then try to pick it up again, but we discover it's not even plugged in. And wait a second, is that Darkrai right there? Oh my, get me out of here. We run back to the safety of the bed, but we still can't wake up, so we head to the phone again. This isn't supposed to happen to you. What isn't supposed to, hello? We run back and forth to the phone, getting more creepy messages and spawning more ghosts in the basement until we're finally able to lay down and return to Thorn's lab. We're never going in that thing again. At least when we return, Thorn has a conclusion. Now bear with me here. You wake up in the middle of a forest on an island you don't recognize. Uh-huh. No one here knows you. No one witnessed your arrival. Uh-huh. There are no injuries or any evidence of you falling from a plane or some sort of Pokemon. There's just no logical, physical way for you to have shown up where you did. Okay? But we live in a world inhabited by fierce deities able to distort time and space. So we must take into consideration that our laws of physics do not apply in special situations. Oh, I get it now. She's insane. We try to walk out on this crackpot, but she just keeps going on and on, explaining our connection to the Genesis Forest, which is the home of Celebi, the time travel Pokemon. She says that Celebi must have something to do with us arriving on the island. Thorn then explains that she examined our physiology and our body turns out to be made up of elements that have yet to be discovered in this world. So Thorn's theory is that we aren't from this world or even from this universe. Instead, she believes that we're probably from a different timeline or even a different reality altogether. Yes, yeah, so that's the leading theory. You got anything else? Nope. 
Okay, we'll, we'll go with that one for now. At least she says that she has a plan to help us get home. After giving us some time to process all this new information, Thorn meets us outside where she tells us about the three temples of the region. One to Palkia, one to Dialga, and a final to Giratina. Below these temples, there's Arcanium War, which is able to absorb some of the power of these Pokemon when they're nearby. And these Pokemon are regularly summoned as a part of the local festivals. Thorn says if we're able to retrieve this charged ore, she believes she can use its stored power to send us through time and space back to where we belong. Unfortunately, Giratina's temple was destroyed 100 years ago when the deity was last summoned. But luckily, Thorn says that we should only need the power of Palkia and Dialga to get home, whose temples remain intact. She also tells us there's currently a character Van headed to the Palkin Heights, getting ready to summon Palkia as a part of the Koros Festival. There's just one problem. The way to the temple is currently blocked by a couple huge boulders, so we'll need Rock Smash to get there. And to get Rock Smash, we have to defeat another member of the council. This council member resides all the way over on the other side of the island in the Dunestone Oasis. So we waste no time and begin our journey across the region. We start off back in the home of the Safari Zone, Amberfield Town, where we head west and meet up with Teal, who forces us into a battle. This team is no joke. He has this fire goat thing, Burnaham, which destroys Shelly, but we bring it back with Smash and Charlie taking out his Rapidash and Staraptor. Then we narrowly defeat his Snorlax and his very cool but very scary fully evolved Cloud Turtle Blastoise. In poetic fashion, this rival battle gives Charlie enough experience to level up and evolve into my favorite Pokemon in this entire game, Egoian Charizard. This battle also marks the point where we've officially earned 77,777 Poke Dollars. You might be asking, what's so special about that number? Well, my friend, if you head over to Echo Rock Town, then cast your hard-earned 77,000 Poke Dollars into this lucky well here, a very special Pokemon called Luck Pup shows up. So we do just that, then catch this jackalope-looking creature and nickname it Luke. In addition to being adorable, Luck Pup is also the pre-evolution of one of the strongest Pokemon in this game, Luckagon. But it's a friendship evolution, so we give it the Soothe Bell, then stick it in the party so that it can start building up those sweet, sweet friendship points. Now with our new Lucky Puppy, we head back to the Amber Trail and battle through the trainers. Then we venture back into the Genesis Forest and eventually navigate our way to the Southern Exit, which brings us to the Hayesport City suburbs. As we're passing through, we get conned into playing a game of hide and seek with the local youth. Ready or not, here. Here comes Daddy Q! Turns out these kids are pretty skilled at hiding, so it takes a while, but eventually we track down these little rascals and move on into the heart of Hayesport City. Here we fish some perfectly good soda pop out of the dumpster and talk with some locals. We are all just a cascading series of cosmic accidents. Stars exploded and created new matter. Billions of years of collapsing stars has resulted in you. That's it! I'm not talking to any more old people in this game. Anyway, we move on to the Pokemon Center, where we find the council member Geralt out front talking to a police officer. Apparently, someone recently stole an important artifact from the local museum, and the city is on lockdown until the thief is found. Naturally, Geralt volunteers us to help solve the mystery, so we begin to immerse ourselves in the seedy underbelly of the city. Before we do that, we figure that we need a Pokemon to help us blend in. So we double back to Sea Ridge Town, where we buy a dust stone from a traveling merchant, which we use on Noctowl to evolve it into its final form, Grimfowl. Foul play, more like foul play, am I right? <laughs> anyway, with this foul foul on our team, we're sure to blend right in with the various criminals and lowlifes of Hayesport. We fly back to the city and decide the best place to start our immersion process would be the speakeasy underneath the flower shop in town. And on our way into the bar, we get mugged. Yeah, we're definitely on the right track here. After fighting off our attackers, we head down into the bar where the trail goes cold. Interesting. We rack our brain and decide we should check the alleyways next. Criminals always hide in alleys. But other than being ambushed by an Egoian Trubbish as we're digging through the garbage, we don't find anything here. Nothing at the casino or the docks either. But since this city is completely full of trainers, all this exploration does end up giving Shelly enough levels to evolve into a Skull Kraken, which is pretty sweet. Then our final lead takes us into the last place we want to go, but the place we always seem to find ourselves: the sewers. This place is an absolute labyrinth, a perfect place for a fugitive to hide. So we begin investigating. Along the way, we catch a steel electric type Egoian Tangela and battle the board workers until we find this young fella hiding in between some barrels of toxic waste. What? 
I didn't take anything, and that's exactly what a thief would say, so we challenge him to a battle. After defeating him, he finally confesses to his crimes, but he goes on to explain that this artifact is sacred to his people, and was removed from their temple without their permission. Worse yet, Geralt wants to give it away as a prize for winning his Pokemon tournament, and that's what made this kid decide to reclaim the artifact. Well, congratulations, I'm officially conflicted. But just after winning us over to his side, he rushes off to turn himself in. So we climb out of the sewers and meet up with Geralt, the police officer, and the sewer boy. Miraculously, everybody is very understanding and empathetic, and the artifact is returned to the museum, and the boy is set free. Great! With that mystery solved, we can finally get back to- wait, what were we doing again? Oh yeah, getting rock smashed to get to the temples, to get the shards, to time travel home. With our end goal crystal clear, we head out west of the city to the Dune Ridge Gorge. We battle through the trainers where we see the Marowak evolution Terrathwack, then we arrive at the Dunestone Desert. At this point, we decide it's as good a time as ever to check out one of those new evolutions. So we grab B, our freshly hatched Eevee out of the box, then give it an expert belt to hold and level it up, which allows it to evolve into the fighting type dog, Champion. From here, we head north of the desert where we find the Dunestone Oasis. After looking around the ruins and meeting up with the sewer boy from Hayesport, Marcus, we finally find the council member Olivia, deep in the ruins. She offers us a free tour of this historic site, and I'm a sucker for free stuff, so we take her up on our offer. This is a palm tree. These trees are native to, like, sandy areas, I guess? Ah, I see now why this tour was free. Eventually, the tour picks up, and Olivia shows us the ruins of the temple to Giratina that was once here, but was destroyed the last time Giratina visited. Then, at the end of the tour, we're immediately forced into a battle against her. This element of surprise helps her get a jump on us early, but we're able to claw the fight back, taking out our Egoian Venusaur and Garchomp with Charlie. With our victory secured, Olivia gives us her badge and the TM for Rock Smash. Then, we fly back to Thorn's Lab to use our new Rock Smashing capabilities to clear the boulders blocking the path and finally head down to the temple to get our piece of charged Arcanium Ore. On our way there, Luckpup finally likes us enough to evolve into the Fairy Dragon pseudo-legendary Luckagon. Then we arrive at the entrance to the Koros Cave, which leads to the temple. Here we meet up with Teal, who tells us that Team Fate arrived just before us and has taken over the area. With no time to lose, we battle our way through the cave and ascend up to the temple. We enter the main chamber, where we find the Team Fate leader, who introduces herself as you. If you're for Palkia, you're too late. I've already captured it. You should put an end to whatever little adventure Professor Thorne has you tasked with. You're dealing with forces beyond your understanding. You can tell Thorne I said that. And with that spicy quip, she leaves. Thankfully, we don't need Palkia to actually be here to accomplish our mission, so we unlock the door to the inner chamber by solving a jigsaw puzzle and proceed inside. Here we find a maze and run into a Pokemon called Gargon, which we catch, then climb down a ladder into the inner sanctum of the temple, where we find the Arcanium Ore that we came for, so we grab it, then return to Thorn's lab. We hand over the ore, then tell her all about our run-in with Team Fate. She responds pretty casually, telling us not to get too caught up with this Team Fate troop and leave them for the proper authorities, which seems like sound advice for a child. Thorn then directs us to the next temple, which lies on a remote island far to the north, just outside of Diamond Peak Town. To get there, we travel to the Haytide Cape, where we find the Ego Council member Chad, who we defeat in battle, and so he rewards us with his badge, as well as the TM for Surf, which we use to surf over to the home of a hermit who sails us up to the northern island. Here we solve some ice puzzles, then arrive at Diamond Peak Town, where we meet up with the final council member, Irene. She says that she prefers to hold her battles outside of town, and tells us to meet up with her outside of the temple. Nice, we were headed there anyway. So we make our way out of town and up to the entrance of the temple, where we meet back up with Irene. Before the battle, she explains more about the calamity from a hundred years ago that we've heard so much about. She says Giratina was intent on destroying the entire region, but Dialga and Palkia showed up just in time and stopped Giratina before it could accomplish its destructive ambitions. Their actions in saving the island is the reason why the people of the region worship Dialga and Palkia. After the lore lesson, we head into battle against the strongest of the Egoian Council. Luckily, she specializes in ice types, so we're able to defeat her Snow Squatch, Grass Squatch, and Sorcerer Ice Squad relatively easily. Then she gives us her badge and the TM for strength, which we can use to access the temple. But just after the battle, Team Fate arrives on the scene and heads into the temple ahead of us. We follow them down into the heart of the cave and arrive just after Yu has successfully captured Dialga. This time, Yu wants to teach us a lesson, so she challenges us to a battle. This battle's in the doubles format, and she isn't messing around, leading with the legends Dialga and Palkia. We're narrowly able to take out Palkia, then she follows up with another huge hitter, the second pseudo-legendary in this 
this game, the bug dragon, Seargal. Thankfully, we're able to defeat it and the rest of her team and make it out of this battle alive. In defeat, Yu leaves the temple and we head back to Thorn's lab, where we realize that we forgot to pick up the shard on the way out. So after going back to the temple and actually getting the shard, we deliver it to Thorn. She places the shards into her machine, then runs a quick diagnostic, which reveals that we are in fact not from a place or time in this reality. And so, surprise, surprise, we're gonna need a charge shard from Giratina's temple in order to get back home. The problem here is that the temple was destroyed 100 years ago. Thankfully, Thorn has a solution. She tells us that in order to get the ore, we'll need to use the power of the other two shards we've already collected to travel back in time 100 years to the last time that Giratina visited the temple. I mean, we don't have too much to lose, so we agree to this plan and hop into this magical mystery machine, get outfitted with this kick-ass time-traveling suit, and teleport 100 years in the past to the Dunestone Oasis, where we find that even with the power of time travel, Team Fate still beat us to the temple. We battle our way into the Inner Sanctum, where we find you in the process of trying to catch Giratina. The legendary Pokemon are in the heat of a battle, which is releasing dangerous amounts of energy. There's a shard of ore within our grasp, but just before we can pick it up, Thorn teleports us out of the temple back to safety. Without the shard, we won't be able to make it home. But yet again, Thorn has a backup plan. She says that there's a shard that still exists today, and it just might have enough energy left in it to be usable. Wait, why can't we just go back in time to the temple slightly before Team Fate was there? Too many questions? Okay. Turns out the last remaining shard is the sacred artifact from the museum in Hayesport, which the council member Geralt just so happens to be giving out as the grand prize of his Pokemon tournament. So we head to Hayesport and sign ourselves up. In the first round, we face off against the council member Olivia's son, Sewer Boy Marcus, who despite having a pretty sweet drag oil and super intimidating muck evolution Uzma, can't stand up against our team. So we move on to the second round, where we face off against the local shiny hunting maniac, who I think really just wants to show off his team more than anything. He does have some pretty amazing shinies to be fair. Melodic, Egoian Fero, Gorachu, Steelix, Metagross, and Lapidion, some real fan favorites in here. But unfortunately for him, this isn't a beauty contest, so we're able to beat him and move on to the next round where we face off against the son of another council member, Koba. His team is able to push us close to the limit with the Hydreigon and Egoian Charizard, but we come out on top, which earns us our spot in the final round against Professor Wormwood's unassuming assistant, Lucy, who proves to be a formidable opponent with her Grimfowl and Dunsparce evolution Quiz Sparse, but we're able to clutch it out and win the tournament, and we're rewarded with the elusive shard. We travel back to Thorn's lab, deliver the shard, and enter the matrix to properly calibrate our machine. Now with all the pieces in place, we're finally ready to go home. But just as Thorn is finalizing everything, the lab shakes and the power is knocked out. We head outside to investigate the disturbance. Here we find none other than the Team Fate leader Yu and her three pet gods. I thought that capturing the deities would have put an end to Thorn's schemes. I should have known better than to think I could outsmart Thorn. I told you to stay out of this. I told you to stop working with her. I didn't want you to have to get involved, Daddy Q. My entire mission was to stop Thorn from using you as a means to her end. Well, this all looks pleasant. Who do we have here, Daddy Q? You know exactly who I am, and at this point, the kid does too. I mean, you do seem a tad familiar, I guess. You explains that Thorn is using us to build a machine that she can use to distort time and reality. The reason I know she's using you is because she did the same to me when I was your age. I am you from an alternate future. She then tells us that in her timeline, Thorn succeeds in building a machine, and the effects of Thorn carelessly hopping through timelines and dimensions are terrible, devastating the people and world she comes into contact with. I was never manipulating Daddy Q. It just so happened that both of our end goals intertwined. Also, I absolutely do care about the ripple effects of our actions through the multiverse. I just see them as too inconsequential to affect my overall pursuit for knowledge. Otherwise, everything else sounds pretty accurate. Crazy plot twist, right? But Thorn fires back. Oh, by the way, if you're gonna try to take the moral high ground, you may want to stop snatching kids out of different realities to work for you. Turns out that all the Team Fate grunts are simply our rival Teal, pulled from alternate timelines that you uses to do her bidding. Huh, now I don't know what to think. Further, Thorn says that these events, her building her machine, and you trying to stop her, have played out dozens of times in various timelines, and Thorn always comes out on top. Then she goes off on some nihilistic monologue about infinity and the futility of existence, blah blah blah, until she drops another bomb. 
Is it not obvious to you yet, Daddy Q? I am you from an even farther future. The big reveal, the patented double twist. She goes on to explain about how she's created a vast network of Daddy Qs from different dimensions and timelines that are all working together to study and explore the infinite number of realities. But every so often, a Daddy Q will go off on their own and rebel, causing this exact same situation to play out. Wow, okay, so, so now what? This is the point where the game presents us with a huge decision. Either battle you or battle Thorn. I mean, traveling to infinite realities does seem pretty sweet, but on the other hand, Thorn does seem pretty evil. Huh. Ultimately, we make the decision to take on Thorn, and maybe put a stop to all this self-perpetuating nonsense once and for all. <laughs> Poor choice, Daddy Q. Behold, the creator of the multiverse, Archaos. Oh, man, uh... Any chance I could change that decision? Nope. Okay, we're doing this thing. We go neck and neck with the primal deity Archaos, losing each member of our team one by one. But we're finally able to clutch out a victory over this god. Unfortunately, Thorn has yet another trick up her sleeve, and she's able to use Archaos to reset the entire reality. In a flash, we're teleported away to another strange place where we see Thorn. Just so you know, Daddy Q, I always plan to send you home. That was always my mission through all of this. She goes on to explain that none of this has been real. In the end, it was all just a dream that our brain conjured up as a way to cope with our actual terrifying reality. We were always just trying to prolong the dream. But alas, the dream is over. Our journey is done. Wake up.